Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series, The More They Know, How Building Knowledge Powers Reading Success. My name is Laura Amazara, and I'm on the literacy team here at Amplified. We are so excited to have you here for today's webinar, especially at this later hour for those of you on the East Coast. And today we have the wonderful Eric Cross presenting Beyond the Science Lab, Building Knowledge Across Curriculum. Before I hand the mic over to Eric, I have a few housekeeping items. Uh, as usual, today's webinar is going to be recorded and we will email out the recording link for, link for you to rewatch as you'd like and share with your colleagues. And everyone here with us today will also receive a certificate of attendance via email. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. And if time allows, we'll get to those at the end. We also encourage you to use the chat feature to converse with all the educators and us here at Amplify. So to get started, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. Uh, we have a couple of West Coasters here. I'm joining from Arizona. I'm in the Phoenix area. And Eric is joining from San Diego. So we've got a couple of uh, afternoon people in the, in the evening time for East Coast, which is always kind of fun. Um, Quick reminder too, we have two more webinars left in this series. Tomorrow, please join us to hear from Amplify CKLA and ELA educators. Uh, it's a nice part two to last week's webinar if you were able to attend that. Uh, we featured admins last week. This week, we're gonna be featuring teachers from those admin schools. And then on Thursday, we're gonna be hosting Nancy Hennessy, who's gonna be talking about constructing comprehension, the contribution of background knowledge. And I'll drop the link to register in the chat in just a moment. And I also want to take a moment to let you all know that we are so excited that our Science of Reading the Podcast is celebrating 5 million downloads. If you are unfamiliar with our podcast, uh, you can check it out at amplify.com slash science dash of dash reading dash the dash podcast. Uh, I also want to take a second to note that Eric is a podcast host for Amplify 2. He hosts Science Connections for us, which is another incredible podcast. And with that, I'd love to pass the mic over to Eric, who is a science educator joining us from San Diego. Eric, please feel free to take it away. Thank you. Shout out to all the folks in the chat. I saw Australia on there, which is rad. I don't even know what time it is in Australia. To Australia. Wait, to, yeah, to Australia. And all my East Coast folks, uh, thanks for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides and make sure that you all can see. And... Are we looking good on the slides? Looks great. Awesome. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, if uh, we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Eric Cross. I'm a middle school science teacher here in San Diego, California. Uh, I also host the Science Connections podcast, and I'm an adjunct professor at the University of San Diego. I teach uh, the ed tech course for pre-service teachers. I also teach the science methods course for pre-service teachers. Uh, I know you're like, where does he find the time? And I was like, I, I don't, I don't have it, but this is fun. And this is, this is a work of passion and being able to do this. Um, my biggest, I'm a big fan of teachers. And, um, so I hope that there's something that can be a value uh, for you today as we talk about building knowledge across the curriculum. Um, our agenda, we're going to talk about progressing student knowledge across, uh, or progressing student science knowledge, and then building knowledge across disciplines. And then with some integration for engagement. So just some ideas that we that I've done and some resources that I can share with you. Um, please use the chat. Uh, I see some of you folks using it there. It, it, it's nice because we get to be able to connect. And I do read that. Um, and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So starting off, uh, these series of webinars were actually based on Scarborough's Rope. And what I'm focusing on is knowledge and kind of the vocabulary piece. So be, being able to build that science knowledge and for those of you who are teaching in the US with uh, NGSS sci science standards, uh, what you'll notice in our science standards, and this is gonna be similar kind of regardless of where you are, is that the knowledge builds over time and becomes more rigorous. And so here you can see our K2, which is our little ones. Uh, this is an example from life science. K2 says all organisms have external parts they use to function, they use to perform daily functions. Now, when they go to three, five, You'll notice in the highlighted section that that kind of increases to both internal and external macroscopic structures. So now kids are learning about what's on the outside and what's on the inside. And then by the time they reach me, they're learning about cells and tissues and organs, and they're learning about how uh, systems are built. And then in high school, they learn about cell specialization and feedback mechanisms. So what you're seeing is this knowledge cycling over time. And we typically see this in most standards all over the place in science where it starts off conceptually very basic, but then we add to it over time. In the science and engineering practices, we see the same thing for NGSS. 
Uh, we start off when we get into K2 and students are engaging in argument. Now, we have writing standards and math standards in our content for NGSS. When they get to 3-5, students begin critiquing and citing their evidence. And then when they get to middle school, now they have to construct arguments. So that's where that kind of CER comes in. And the reason why I chose this is because a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today really revolves, the connect, revolves around the connection between science and literacy. We need those skills to really help show what our students can do in science. Our students need reading, writing, speaking, and listening. They're doing it all the time. And one of the great things about science is, and I'm definitely biased, it's the most engaging subject. Everything that happens around us is science. And helping our students be able to communicate about what's happening and communicate their understanding is only gonna empower them to be better learners and ultimately be more successful later on as they proceed outside of school, maybe into college or into the workforce. The last aspect of NGSS is the cross-cutting concepts. And here we see the cycling of patterns. In multiple grades and multiple subjects, patterns is, a, is one of the cross-cutting concepts. And we see this in our standards. I chose patterns just as an example, but the reason why I show these three illustrations is to show you how the knowledge is repeating each year for students and it's building each year. And that is how our students learn and develop literacy. Um, we want our students to be able to look at the disciplinary core ideas, the cross-cutting concepts and the science and engineering practices. And when they're doing this, this helps support our English language learners, our students with language processing difficulties and our students with limited literacy development uh, because there's so much academic language. I think in biology alone in high school, there are 3000 new words uh, in those four years, more than any other content area. In the Spanish textbook, there are 1,500 new words. So just to put it in, in comparison, like we're teaching another language when we're teaching science. And so our dependence on teachers of literacy, which is all of us, but especially our English, teacher English teachers is really, really important. So how do we access what our students already know? Well, one really practical way is doing a student connection survey. So our students bring in these funds of knowledge into the classroom and depending on where you are, whether it's Australia or the Philippines or New York or Jersey or Arizona, our students are bringing in existing knowledge. So how do we tap into that? It can be challenging, especially if you're teaching in a place where you're not familiar. That's not where you grew up. But one of the practical ways is a connection survey. And all of these resources, by the way, will be shared with you in a Google Doc during this presentation. So we'll drop that into the chat. So if you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, don't. Every tool that I share with you, I put in one Google Doc with links to everything that I've been doing or anything that I share. So in the Students Connection Survey, it's a Google form. And what it does is it just assesses what students are coming into your classroom with. And I've created a link and we've already dropped it. Thank you so much. Dropped it in the chat right there. You can modify this to your heart's delight. You can change it as much as you want. And I start off the school year with this every year. I start with some basic questions about who they are, I ask them about their internet access at home, who they live with, and then I start getting into some more soft questions about their pets or about their living situation. I wanna know if my students are going back and forth from different homes. Um, what activities or traditions do you celebrate with your family? What chores do you have? Are there any important holidays? And then one question, one of my favorite ones is what makes you smile no matter what? This is kind of a softer question, but this is one of the ways that I can build relationships with my students when I know what really makes them happy or excited. Do you have any hobbies? Who do you look up to and why? And as after this webinar, you can click on the link and you can use these questions, you can remix them, you can change them. But imagine starting off the school year with a spreadsheet of this soft data. Now, once I've given this to 200 students, the next day I have all of this data and I go through it in the evening and I start flagging different things. One of the questions that I look at is, what are you good at? When a student says nothing, I mark that in red because that's a student that I know I'm gonna to need to build some self-efficacy for. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? What they're telling me right there is the resilience. What have you experienced? So imagine as a teacher, you having this data and starting off the school year as a science teacher, they're telling you their experiences, where they've traveled, all of those great things. And one caveat to this, I never ask my students to do this unless I've told my story first. So I think it's important that we don't ask our students to be vulnerable unless we're willing to be 
create that perceived vulnerability first. So I always start off the school year and tell my story about why I became a teacher and why I'm there. Once they know that, they're much more willing to answer these questions. And they're all optional. Students can choose to answer them or not, but I do create an opportunity for them to do it. And about 98% of my students complete all of the questions. So let's move on. We're in the age of AI. And if you've listened to the podcast or you've listened to me talk ever, you'll notice that it's one of the things I've been talking about lately. So uh, feel free to drop in the chat. Are you using AI for anything? Have you been experimenting with chat GPT or Bard or Anthropic or anything like that, Claude? It's all right, this is a safe place. Uh, we're not we're not gonna post everything you know, on, on, on Twitter or X or social media. Um, if you haven't used it for anything, here's one thing you might consider. Here are a couple prompts that you can type in. With ChatGPT, if you type in, you're a STEM curriculum expert, create questions for a science teacher that are designed to explore middle school students' personal experiences and engagement with science topics in the areas of physics, chemistry, and biology. What you're doing, essentially, is you're asking it to generate questions that will access their funds of knowledge. I mean, that will give you an answer in about five seconds. It's like a collaborator. Or maybe in my second prompt, you want to generate questions for elementary school students. Maybe you want to put in a specific topic. There's all kinds of ways that we can use this, but this is one simple way. Francis is using all of the AIs right now, by the way, if you're monitoring the chat. This is one simple way we can generate some new questions. Maybe you're teaching in a population of students in a rural area, or maybe you're teaching in a population of students who have recently immigrated from another country. And you want to be able to ask some questions to access their funds of knowledge. If you're, if you type that in, it's amazing with the results that you'll get. Some of these questions that I've shared with you are some of the questions that I was able to get from ChatGPT and AI. Now it's really like collaborating with another person. So if you've never tried it, I want to encourage you to. Um, many of the platforms are free, and ChatGPT is even woven into Bing, which I know nobody says like Bing it, but to be honest. Bing is kind of leading the way right now with its AI technology and, it, and it's free. It doesn't cost anything. So some practical tips. When, uh, actually, I'm going to come back to this slide because the slide's a little bit out of order. So I apologize for that. I'm going to come back to this slide. Building background knowledge. Well, there's three main ways for us to do that. The first is informational text. Next is videos and simulation. And third is simple experiments. These are some of the ways that we can give our students background knowledge about science. Sometimes they don't come into our classroom with knowledge about it, so we can create it, which for me as a teacher is the most fun. But how do we help our students access informational text? What about when you're differentiating between a grade level, reading level of second grade and 12th grade all in the same classroom? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone have the widest differentiation of like reading abilities, but you have them all right in front of you and you're serving them? That's, that's pretty challenging. Well, there's some neat tools out there that you can use to help with that. And the first one I want to share with you is one called uh, Diffit. With this, you can adapt any text, generate summaries, key questions, export it to docs, and it happens pretty much instantly. So let me go ahead and demonstrate it. In this example, I use Amplify for my curriculum. Uh, we're in the middle of the metabolism unit, and there's an article that we've read. It's this article on diabetes. There's four articles. This is one that my students read, and it's one of the more challenging articles. And I have students that are multilingual learners. I'm still trying to get English right. And I have 12-year-olds that are speaking two and three languages. It's a beautiful thing. But how do I serve them? How do I ensure that they can access this information? Well, here's what I do. I take the link to that PDF, and I go to Diffit. And I select article or video, and I paste the URL in there. I choose an appropriate reading level. Maybe for these students, it's going to be fifth grade. Depends on the Lexile score. I can go up and down if I want. I'm going to choose fifth grade, and the language is going to be English. If I want to, I could translate it. And then I'm going to click Generate Resources. And watch what it does. As it's loading, and for some of you, this might be your first AI experience. As it's loading, it's taking my article generating new questions, vocab lists, and re, uh, rewriting it so it's Lexile level meets a five, fifth grade audience. So here it is. Here's my article rewritten for a fifth grade reader. Here's a summary with key points. Here's a vocab list pulled from the article. 
and then multiple choice questions with an answer key. And if I wanna do more rigorous questions, I have short answer questions here and open-ended prompts. Teachers, how long would that take you to make based off an article? Be honest, type it in the chat. We're, we're sitting there after school or on your prep and you're trying to generate this. How long, how long would that take with an article? For me, it, it would take at least, I wanna say 20 minutes to an hour and being able to generate this. Yeah, a while, right? Like Jennifer is like, she's covered it right there. But that's, I feel like the sham wow guy right now, but I'm gonna say, but wait, there's more. So I'm gonna click export and share. And then I'm gonna click printable doc. Now I can export it to a Google form, instant quiz. I can support it to the Freyer model of vocabulary, a CER. I'm just gonna do printable doc. I'm gonna click on it and open with docs. So now what it's doing is it's generating a doc with a graphic organizer for students. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up. And there it is, all based on the article. There are the terms, definitions, and example sentences. There is the article, the reading summary, questions, short answer, everything that was covered there, ready to print or ready to be modified. So this is a way that I can use as a system I can use as a scaffold to be able to support emerging readers, or if I want to give them an advanced article, Jessica, yeah, it's free. It's free right now. So like, you know how it is with, with tech, right? Like everything I'm going to show you is free right now. Now, if we did this webinar, like in a few months from now, I don't know, but while it's free, I'm using it. So there you go. And again, this is all linked in, in the information in the chat or in the, uh, in the, the Google doc that I have here. And this is the right up here at the top in the top, right? That bit.ly bit.ly slash amplify capital A BSL for beyond the science lab. And uh, we've been dropping it in the chat as well. Next is a Chrome extension called brisk. And again, this is free as well. So let's say I want to get an article from a website and this article is we'll use, um, I think I was using science news. There we go. Science news, some cockatoos craft drumsticks, then woo mates like a rock star. I don't think this is just unique to cockatoos because I think my middle school students do the same thing, at least based on the beats that I hear on my desk. So I want to use this article for my students right here. And there's all kinds of stuff on here. There's ads. It's written at some kind of Lexile level. I may not know what it is. But what I've done is I've installed a Chrome extension. It's in the bottom right-hand corner. You might not be able to see it on your screen. It's just a little tiny circle. It's called Brisk. It doesn't cost anything if you're an educator. If I click on it, I have the ability to change the reading level and I could translate it. So I'm going to click Spanish fifth grade and change reading level. And what it's going to do is open a Google doc. It'll grab the information and then it'll translate the article into the language. Think about how quickly this happens. Imagine you're in a classroom and you're working with students that speak multiple languages. And you're trying to ask people to translate or you using Google Translate or all these different types of things just for workflow, being able to generate it this way just saves us so much time, which is the one commodity I can't get back. So these are two things that I've been using recently to really be able to support my students and give them access to reading a little bit faster. I, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I, I overanalyze whether I'm providing enough scaffolds for my students or if I'm over scaffolding. Um, or I'll go back and revise units over and over. I'll kind of get in this trap of like, what else can I add? How many sentence frames can I add? With this, this allows me to have some free time to go back and really do more creative things with my lessons now that the article has been rewritten. So a couple of tools that you can use um, that are, allow our students to have access to be able to build background knowledge through informational text. Next is Edpuzzle. Now, if you haven't used Edpuzzle before, this will take any video and allow you to embed formative questions in the video, and then you can collect data. And it syncs to most major learning management systems. So if you use Google Classroom or Canva or Schoology, all of those wild things, you can, you can integrate Edpuzzle with it. So I'm gonna show you just a short example. And so I stay on brand. You wanna guess what technology has been in, integrated into Edpuzzle recently? It has two letters, anybody wanna take a guess? Go ahead and type in the chat. So right now I'm in my Edpuzzle. I can search any video on YouTube or I can upload my own. I'm gonna search for a video 
Let's just do cells. It's fresh in my mind. We'll take this Bill Nye video on cells. Oh, actually, I like the Amoeba sisters. So we'll, we'll take them. Now, what you'll see here is these little teardrops. Those are questions that another teacher made, which is one of the great things. Janet, you get the prize. You call it AI. I could remix this. I can use this teacher's ed puzzle. And what'll happen is when my students watch it, it'll stop at certain points and ask a question, my like a multiple choice question. Here's an example. At this timestamp, it asked, how does, multi how does a multicellular organism grow in size? There's three answers. The student chooses the answer, clicks submit, and the video continues. You could do this with your own videos about procedural things. Imagine you were a sub or you had a sub video that you made when you were gone. You can give instructions and then build informative questions to students to pause them along the way to make sure they really understood as a check for understanding. Or you want to give them a video about forces in motion or about ecosystems. Well, after each bit of information was shared, the video can be paused and it will give them a question and it will track their correct answers and incorrect answers. They can even go back and rewatch it. And recently there was a new feature that was added. So let's say you want to remix this assignment or you have a video uh, that you want to, to use. Once I have my video, I can generate questions um, from the video. So if there's a video, let's see, I'm just gonna jump on YouTube real quick. Don't judge my search history. So YouTube, oh, this is my school account, so we're good. And let's find a video. We're going to do, um, let's see if the CNN 10, we watch if that all the time. If you're thinking about buying solar panels. Go ahead and grab that. And I'm going to go into Edpuzzle. And I'm going to paste this here and click search. So there's the video. Now that the video is loaded, I'm going to click on questions and then generate questions. And I want you to watch what happens on the left-hand side. When I click generate questions, I can choose open-ended or multiple choice. I'm gonna do both. And let's do multiple choice. Let's see if this one works. Of course, it's the one time it tells me that it's not able to do it. Let's see, generate questions, open-ended. All right, let's try a different one. We'll do crash course. And let's go ahead and take this video. The French biochemist and Nobel laureate, Dr. All right, and let's go to questions. Generate questions, open-ended. Oh, this one's not letting me do it. Well, what should happen is it should automatically generate questions. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it not work. Um, but this that's one of the things that ended up happening when you try to do things live. So we'll try one more. Maybe it's down because it doesn't look like it's working with any of my videos right now. Generate questions, both. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go on the left-hand side. It generated questions. These... So anyways, that's Edpuzzle, and it integrates into Google Classroom, Canva. This is a way that you can use videos and simulations to help build that student's background knowledge. Uh, yeah, Karen, I know it happens, but um, to be honest, like this is the first time I've used it for years. This is the first time I've been having these issues with it. So try it out on your own. Give it a try. Um, I'm confident they'll probably get things figured out. Maybe they, they have things down because it's like after school hours for a lot of folks. And then simple, simple science lab. So one of the, my favorites for doing this is the Exploratorium Science Snacks. Uh, science Snacks are hands-on science activities that explore natural phenomena that teachers and students can do using like common, inexpensive, readily available materials. And the way they work with the Exploratorium is they use multiple science snacks to kind of lead into a more complex phenomena that you're trying to explain. And on their website, which is linked in the resources, they have hundreds of science snacks. This is a simple one, the naked egg. You might've done this before where you soak the egg in vinegar and then you soak it in water and then you soak it in corn syrup and you watch basically the process of osmosis. 
many, if not all of these labs could be do, done with things that you can find around the house or around the average school classroom. And so I recommend that you try these out. Uh, it's a way, especially if you have a low budget, to be able to help students build this background knowledge in science without breaking the bank. Um, my favorite resource for uh, middle school labs is actually the 99 cent store that's down the street from my school. Uh, that's where I walk during my prep to buy basic things that we can do in the classroom. And most of the things that I need to do, I can get from the 99 cent store. And a lot of the things I use are science snacks. Moving on, our next step is uh, interdisciplinary teaching. So this can be a, a big concept for educators who's never done it, but I, I am a big advocate for interdisciplinary teaching when it can be done. Um, what it is essentially is it's the, the overlap of different content areas. Interdisciplinary teaching is integrating the application from different disciplines, science, engineering, math, history, art, when, but examining one theme or issue or question. And it does a few different things. One, it, it's the way the world really works. We teach in silos. We've been doing this for 150 years where the content areas are divided, but in real life, our knowledge and things that we need to do cross back and forth. Rarely is science done in isolation. We need to be able to write. We need to be able to, to, to do math. And so when we do interdisciplinary teaching, it actually reflects the complexity of the real world. The next thing it does is it helps students be able to build a new schema when they're taking knowledge from one content area and then transferring similar ideas to another content area. It actually, I, from like a marketing perspective, I call it like similar branding. When you see similar words or ideas in different context areas, it's less of a cognitive lift for our students. They say, oh, we talked about this in English. We talked about this in science. I already have information on this. I can learn this a lot better. And so it's easier for them versus learning two different subjects, but we're trying to teach the same discrete skills. Um, next, it enhances engagement. And I've anecdotally, I've seen this across the board. When we are talking about similar subjects or I co-plan with teachers and we do an interdisciplinary lesson or activity, their engagement is so much higher. They just, the relationships that both teachers have, the involvement, and then just the, the integration of different content areas really lends itself to, to more student participation. So some examples for, from a science perspective could be biology and art. Students can explore biology um, through looking at art and nature illustrations. Uh, they can study plants and animals, ecosystems, learn how to paint them accurately. This is what old school naturalists would do if you all you had was a pen and paper. Um, it lets them see the details closely, be able to analyze things, look at scale and how big things are, um, and also express their artistic and science knowledge. Um, environmental science and geography, looking at ecosystems, climate change, um, different habitats, weather patterns, uh, geographical features in an area. I mean, there's so many different things. Plus, it could also get them outside, which they love. Uh, another example, astronomy and history. Um, looking at astronomy and history through the lens of space exploration, learning about uh, the development of different telescopes and astronomers, uh, significant milestones, or how certain advancements in history allowed us to make new inventions into the future. Uh, this reminds me of playing the game um, Civilization, where you couldn't build a new technology unless you've mastered some of the old ones. Anyways, that's my nerdy gaming side coming out. And one of the schools that's done a really great job of this happens to be here in San Diego. Um, but the great thing about them is they publish all of their, their projects. So it's called High Tech High, and they're big on what's called project-based learning. So project-based learning are interdisciplinary disciplinary projects that students do throughout the course of the year, and teachers work together in content areas. And what they've done is they've published all of their interdisciplinary projects from elementary all through high school. And the great thing is you can take them and remix them, so you don't have to go and invent, reinvent the wheel. The direct link to their projects is in the resource document. So if you look at it, there's a section that says High Tech Hire HTH. You can click on that and get ideas. I'm much more of an educational DJ than an MC. And if you're not a hip hop person, what that means is a DJ remixes existing you know, music, whereas an MC writes music. I love taking curriculum and ideas and remixing it to fit the needs of my students. That's how I am as an educator. 
Um, some folks, and I value them, they're the MCs. They write the curriculum, they develop it, and I, I lean on them so that I can come up with innovative ideas of my own. And then some ideas from my own classroom. So integrating for engagement. So this is an example of where the English team and the um, science team, we work together. So we were doing genetics and students in English happened to be reading The Giver. This was an organic dovetail, by the way. We didn't build this from scratch. We just happened to be teaching the same thing. And we were in the break room together talking. And I said, my students are learning about genetic modification. And they said, we're reading The Giver. Well, I said, what's The Giver? They said, well, it's a book where the children are genetically engineered. It's like a dystopian novel. And so we worked together and the English team helped to write, help my students write their Hunger Games project. So what Hunger Games is, is students work in groups of four and they take two existing animals and they crossbreed them to make a genetic creature that needs to battle. Think like Pokemon. And they battle an oral debate and they make these posters and they have to do Punnett squares. They have to write descriptions. They have to do all kinds of things. They have to make a website. And I'll show you an example. These students have now, these are examples of students who are now in college, but they make a Google site. They write a description of one animal, polar bear. They do drawings. Everything has to be original drawings, nothing digital. They do the traits. So they practice their punnett square skills. And then they do their sources in MLA format. And this was a hybrid creature. This is the owler bear. So they write a description of the owler bear and they have their drawing. This is the battle. So they take the traits of the best battle traits of both creatures and they put them together and they only get six punnett squares. So they only get six boxes that they can do to grab the traits. So this one had swim and vision, swipe speed, adaptive and the ability to fly, traction, feet and hearing, blubber talons, fur and flight. And then for my bio folks out there, yes, I sacrificed uh, accuracy for understanding in this so that we did take some creative liberties in uh in doing these punnett squares so i wanted to make sure i disclose that before someone calls me out on it and then their sources now when teams battled they were able to look at each other's posters which is what you see here in the bottom right hand corner because if you found an error the student and that team lost that trait they didn't they couldn't battle with it anymore so if you did your punnett square for venom wrong you can't use it in the battle and then each team was dropped into a specific biome. And if your animal wasn't adapted for that biome, it might die instantly. For example, if the biome was ocean and you couldn't swim, you instantly lost. If the biome was the desert and you were an aquatic creature who couldn't breathe air, instantly lost. So there was a lot of complexity in this. Now in the resources, I put a link to the task sheet and to two student examples. This is one of those things where I had a high level of engagement that I couldn't predict. And it was a, a idea that came from another teacher that I met at, at a conference somewhere, but it was the most beloved activity that we did. And the reason why is because it was collaborative, it was competitive, it was interdisciplinary, and it was creative. It wove together all of these principles. And it, what it did is organically students wanted to write more. They wanted to keep working on this project. I had to stop them from working on it because they kept wanting to improve things and rewrite things and make sure that their, their, their lettering and their syntax and their Punnett squares were all correct. Um, this is one of those lessons, teachers, if you've done this long enough where like you feel like lightning strikes and you're like, how do I clone this and do this in multiple activities? The next one I'm gonna show you is a simpler one. And I literally did it three hours ago, my time. So what I had students do right now, they're doing a summative on cell respiration and metabolism. Google has a program called Applied Digital Skills. It's free. It has curriculum and rubrics. If you Google it, it'll come up. And there's a lesson called If Then Adventure Story. Well, what that is, is it teaches students how to do an If Then Adventure Story. And if you're not familiar with this, the old school books, let me show you. So this is their example. And if anybody's read those books, remember the books were like, it says you go into the cave and then do you turn left or do you turn right? If you turn left, you go to page 39. If you go to turn right, you go to page 65. Do you all remember those? You gotta be old enough to remember those. Um, if you don't remember them, don't say anything. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So in this example, you're on a rainforest and you go on an adventure, what do you do? do you go in a canoe, do you walk, do you drive? Um, let's do paddle the canoe. And it takes me to another slide. We're looking at these fish, we see piranhas under the canoe, what do we do? 
stop and take pictures or paddle faster? We're going to paddle faster. You'll notice that depending on what I click, it takes me to a different place. And the way that works is when I back out, all students did is they link their slides to different, to different sections. So for instance, here where it says drive, that is linked to slide four. Where it says walk, it's linked to slide three. And where it says paddle a canoe, it's linked to slide seven. So once I taught them that skill, I said, make a choose your own adventure about cell respiration. And here's what it looked like. So in class, this is literally my board. This is a task sheet. Your story must include cell respiration, be creative. You have to show me you understand it, but you have to use these words. Now you could do this with any content area. Anybody could do choose your own adventure. You could do physics. Elementary school kids could do this. High school kids could do this. This taps into something something in students that really hooks them. I've done this for years and it's, there's, it's a phenomena that I've been trying to figure out what is it about this project? Once they're done, I collect their slide links and I put it into one spreadsheet. So every student has access to everybody else's slides and they wanna see each other's, but you know what that does is it creates an authentic audience and students end up writing more and more and more because they wanna perfect it. Well, what is that doing? Well, one, it's, practicing their literacy skills, but two, it's also reinforcing the science learning because they're looking for this aspect of cell respiration in there. Now they don't realize it. They think they're just having fun. But as you go around my class, what you see is just collaboration and on topic talk the entire time. I wish it was like this all the time. It's not teachers. I'm just to let you know, I'm showing you the highlights right now. This is like, you're looking at my Instagram reel, but you're not seeing like the bloopers. I'm not showing you that real right now. So I just want to be like full disclosure. Eric's class is not like this every day, um, but he's working on it. He's working on it. So here's a student example. I, I, I gave them two days to work on this. That's it. Two days. This is an example from one of my dungeon masters. I run the Dungeons and Dragons club. I just want to show you uh, the example. Um, where do I go to start the if then? Oh, uh, Erica, it's in the it's in the um, the resources. The if then adventure story. It's one of the resources in there. If you click on it, it'll show you kind of how to do it. All right, let's do this one together. First of all, like, is the graphics? Imp this is in Google Slides. Like a student made this. They pixelated it. So we're gonna start. You find yourself adventuring across a riverbank upon a ridge. Nightfall is coming, so you must think of a camp. Uh, you seek a feast. So we continue. The river, I have to get across the river. Do I jump over it? Do I wade? Or do I camp where I'm at? Um, I did this in class live with everybody, by the way. And so I figured out the answer is to swim across. Um, we get across, we set up our camp. We wake up and we go down the road and we see a target. So we're going to approach it slowly. Um, oh, I died. I went the wrong way. So I'm going to go back and have a snack. Yeah, there's dead ends in this. I'm going to do some more. Nope. Can't do more hunting. Went the wrong way. I'm going to learn more. By the time we get to the end of the slide, the student took the kind of analogy of a city and had it to, and create connected it with cells. And they said that the cells need glucose and oxygen to function with both of these things. The city produces CO2, water, and power. They did not have to go this far into it. They did not have to create this many slides. They did not have to be this, this creative. They did this completely on their own. This is 25 different slides that we did in two hours. They went home and worked on this. That's how seriously they took it. Like it, and Jennifer, it's, it's great, but here's what it did is it tapped into something. And if you listen to the science of reading, Susan and I presented in the last podcast. And one of the things that she said that I want to act like I did intentionally, but I stumbled into it is that students are creating narrative, which is very accessible. And so when they were able to create this narrative and integrate this artistic aspect to things, their engagement level went up and they started iterating on their projects, but also they're iterating on these, the science concept. We're doing the summative tomorrow. And my expectation is that they're going to do really well on the concept of cell respiration. Um, the last slide, and I, I jumped past this one just because it was out of order. So I apologize. That's teacher mistake is I do wanna go back to the practical tips on interdisciplinary teaching. Um, just a few things, because it could be daunting if you've never done it. 
And so like teacher to teacher talk, first one, find where there's a natural curriculum overlap between you and a content area. For me, when I'm teaching the microbiome is the first unit, they talk about scale and proportion. Well, you know what? My seventh grade math team talks about that too. That was the most organic crossover. And so we started working together on that so that students can hear the same concepts in different classes from different perspectives. Next, just do a single lesson or a micro unit. If you're just getting started with this, start small with motivated teachers. Um, and then afterwards, this is the pro tip, tell the story of how it went and celebrate that teacher publicly. If you're working with an English teacher or you're working with a math teacher or history and they work with you and create something interdisciplinary, tell it publicly, blast them positively, take pictures, shout them out, praise them, all of that. It's, it, it's, it's good, like one for relationship building, but you know what low key teachers, we don't always hear that stuff. So when we feel good and our colleagues make us feel good, we're more likely to do it again. And so reinforce that positivity. If someone's willing to collaborate with you and they don't have to, and they're motivated, like celebrate them, shout them out, let them know, um, because that's going to help other teachers want to catch on too. Next, create a shared summative assessment and backwards plan. Figure out where you want to end and then work backwards from there. That way you can align all of the lessons to really be directed towards where you want students to go. It's really easy if you do it backwards to like have these lessons that kind of like, they're cool, but they have nothing to do with what you're gonna assess. So they end up spending more time and becoming more of a cognitive load for our students to remember things that they don't really need. So start where you want them to go and end up and then plan backwards from there. Next, scale for what's doable. We're all in different parts of the world. Start with what you can do, bloom where you're planted. Some of these things that I've done, I didn't start here. I'm here now, this is my 10th year of teaching. And I've tried things and failed and some things worked and some things didn't, but I'm a science teacher and there's no such thing as failure. Even though I just said it, there's only data. So if something didn't work, all right, that's data, it didn't work. We're gonna move on to the next thing. Like having that short goldfish attention span as far as remembering the things that don't work. Nope, all right, we're gonna move on. We're gonna try something new. And then last is asynchronous is okay. You don't have to do an inter interdisciplinary lesson at the same time. Your teacher, you can do it first and they can do it weeks or months later. Matter of fact, that could be awesome because the student's prior knowledge is gonna come from that other teacher or from you. And it won't be ancient prior knowledge. It'll be, oh, we did that two months ago. Let me bring that back again. And now we're cycling back through it, which is gonna help students retain that knowledge even more. Okay. Eric's talked for like 45 minutes and we're at 62, which means you all have stayed. Teachers, I, I, I wonder if there's any questions. I hope that there's something of value that you can go and apply, even if it's just one of the tools. But being able to practically weave these connections together between literacy, building background knowledge for our students, accessing their funds of knowledge is only going to help science. And science is only going to help those literacy areas. And we have to be the ones that show teachers how to do it. We are often the ones who get time cut. Elementary school teachers, you have so much pressure because of math and English state testing and what shows up on dashboards and all those different types of things. We need to be the evangelists to say, hey, look, we can actually supplement and support these things. My students are really engaged with it. Let me show you what they can do. And uh, if we can do that, I think we'll, we'll impact education in a really, really positive way. So um, we have a little bit of time left. I wanted to see if we, oh, yes, we have a little bit of time left. So if there's any questions, please drop those in the chat. Um, please make sure you get the resources so you can uh, access the, that stuff later. My contact information for social media is on the slides. Um, teachers, thanks for being here so late in the evening. I appreciate you. And thank you for doing what you're doing on behalf of kids. Yes, thank you so much, Eric. That was absolutely incredible. It was a lot of fun to witness. Uh, I definitely remember doing some of that stuff when I was a student, uh, what feels like a million years ago. And it definitely resonated with people. Lots of people were saying in the chat that they've done stuff like that. They remember it too. Um, I would love, if anyone has any questions, we definitely have some time. And as you've seen, Eric is a wealth of knowledge and a bit of an open book. Uh, so please feel free to throw those in the chat or the Q&A. We'll, we'll give it a moment or two. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to share last a couple of, of things. Um, 
Once more, I'm going to throw the link for Eric's resources in the chat so you all have easy access to it. Uh, please feel free to use that as much as you'd like. Um, we also have, let me, let me bring up another screen so you can see. Uh, we have two more webinars left in this series. So please be sure to join us for those. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking to some, some more educators. And then on Thursday, we're going to be hosting Nancy Hennessy to talk more about background knowledge. Uh, I am going to throw that link in the chat as well in just a moment. And you'll also be receiving an email at the, uh, later this week with a link to the recording and also some information about your certificate of attendance. Uh, and before we depart, in case no other questions have popped up, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, let you all know again that we have a knowledge building bundle where, where we go into more detail about all, a lot of the stuff that Eric has talked about. So it really talks about why you should build knowledge, how you can build knowledge, curricula that can help you do that, how to choose that curricula. Um, really takes a lot of what Eric shared to another, another level. Um, we got lots of great resources in there for you. Um, not seeing any questions. So uh, with that, just want to take one more second to say thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, one more thing too, if you enjoyed our time with Eric today, as a reminder, he's the host of our one of our podcasts, Science Connections. So I just threw the link in the chat for you to subscribe and listen there. Um, and thank you so much for your time, especially those of you who joined us at um, outside of working hours times and those for those of you that joined us from afar. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone.